Just wait for Eleanor to join. Let me get started. few technical difficulties. <laughs> that one should have come through, I don't know, for you to join. I send it again. That request should be coming through now. I don't know if you to accept. If you decide to go ahead and accept it, and then we should be able to get started. Too sure why it's not working. Is that one coming through? I don't know for you to join. Oh, Am I there in? we go. I'm yeah, in, yeah. yes. <laughs> Just wait until Finally, and we had a trial <laughs> run, and it's still, um, yeah. there we go. Yeah, I did, I left, and then I, I came back, and then he let me back in, yeah. So, yeah, God, I was like, that was a bit like, <laughs> touch and go then. <laughs> yeah, of course, technical difficulty for you. Just wait and see if anyone else is waiting to join, and then we'll get to No start. worries. Can you hear me okay as well? Is my volume all right? Yeah, everything seems to be okay. Perfect. Ah, <coughs> mm. oh, Sam we... here. <laughs> yeah. If we just get started now, and then anyone who joins can ask any questions along the way. Um, if anyone's no through uh, in the chat, we'll try and answer them. Um, or I'll just ask them, um, and then any other questions at the end, really. So if we just start off with a bit about you, where you come from, just general. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, well, special hello to my mother-in-law, <laughs> who just joined. Um, right, okay, so my name's Eleanor, and I am a solicitor and a founder of my own law firm now. So um, I've been working, so I'm a personal injury solicitor. I've been doing that for almost, 10 years now um i actually haven't worked in any other area of law um so that's what i started in and that's sort of what i will probably do for the rest of my um 
legal professional career um so trained qualified and became a partner in personal injury law and then i started my own firm on the 1st of december wow amazing um have you ever perhaps like considered other areas of law any other areas of law that interested you yeah i did like when when i was sort of studying law i loved employment law that was like i really thought that i would go into employment mm -hmm. law um, i loved everything about it i love the way it kind of like impacted people's lives and um you know like everybody has a job and the law is there to like protect you as an employee um, or even like as an employer, it regulates like, you know, how you can treat people. So I've, I found that really, really interesting. Um, but it just so happened that when I finished the LPC, um, I didn't realise that like the North West and Manchester were so heavily dominated by personal injury firms. Wow. Um, that's where all the big sort of... Um, injury firms are based and they recruit a lot a lot of sort of um you know graduates and students and paralegals so i kind of just ended up in um in a large personal injury firm um and and then i, I sort of left that role and then i went into another paralegal role at another personal injury firm and yeah i just never got out <laughs> 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 um, so can you tell us just a bit about why you chose perhaps like the legal profession and other, other professions that you may have considered before? Yeah, I don't think I actually considered many other professions. Um, I think it was always like law or nothing. Um, I just was fascinated by it. Um, there was like... I, <laughs> This will sound really wrong, but I, I like I like having like a good argument, but not like an argument where you're fighting with someone or you're screaming with someone. It's not like not that those types of arguments. I like yeah. having like quite a well thought out planned argument and knowing where you're going to take it. So when you know the law, it, it empowers you. Yeah. Um, because no matter who you meet you know it doesn't have to be in personal injury it doesn't have to have to be in in a particular area of law but you feel um like you know like you, you like you have a, like a, like you can you can formulate a good argument and you can get your point across really well and that's something that i think university um the LPC um, and even just working in law teaches you just how to formulate a, a good argument and you know to know if you're going to win or to lose um, you know and ultimately I think I like the idea of you know if you can't reach an agreement with your opponent where well, you can go to court and you know you, you get a judge to decide your case and I find that you know really really interesting because I have a lot of cases and, and they you know they, they, they're disputed you know you're never going to see eye to eye with your opponent that's the whole yeah. point um, otherwise there'd be no point of, of, of you know a legal system if we all agreed on something um which you know which just so happens that we don't a lot of the time and then you can take your case to a judge and ask them to decide um so yeah definitely i liked um i like winning an argument yeah. <laughs> <laughs> perfect profession yeah um, so if we just go on to a bit about how you've got to where you are, really. Um, so if we just start off um, from square one, really, what A-levels did you do, perhaps? A-levels, yeah, God. Um, <laughs> this, this made me think back a little bit. So I did government and politics, um, psychology, and I did history, and I did <clears throat> geography as an AS level, which you mm -hmm. drop after your first year. Um, we didn't we didn't have law law wasn't a topic that i could pick government and politics was the closest yeah. um that i could pick to to law um yeah and i think i got something like bbc in in my grade so i didn't do didn't do particularly bad didn't do particularly well it was enough to get me into uni um yeah. and i actually started um a degree in business management um i didn't actually start a degree in law it was only after the first year that i realized that i wasn't really enjoying it mm -hmm. and we actually had a module on business law and it was the only module that i did enjoy so that's why i then changed and i just um started a law degree so i ended up doing four years at uni one year of the business management degree and then i changed and i started uh, the llb um from year one so yeah so that, that that was sort of in terms of my studying and then um after uni i went on to the lpc and i did that full time and i did the corporate route yeah. um because i thought i would go into like your magic circle firm so i think i was doing exactly what i see so many 
law students doing um which is aiming like really high which is great like it's you know that's amazing um but that isn't where my career sort of ended up at all and you know like i did the whole you know hundreds of applications for training yeah. contracts you know with with <laughs> this is going to be so many people that are doing that and you know i get loads of questions now about i do a lot of like cvs and careers and things like that and i try and help students and i review cvs um and i could see you know sort of them doing what I was doing um, and it just didn't sort of end up like that. I ended up moving to do the LPC in Manchester and ended up getting, you know, a, a paralegal job that way. And then um, once I had a few years of paralegal and experience in personal injury, it kind of made sense for me to stop applying to corporate firms because I yeah. didn't have the experience. Um, I couldn't really probably compete with a lot of people that, that were applying for those jobs that did have corporate experience. Um or may have had more of an interest in it as well. At this point, you know, I, I wasn't really probably that interested in it either. Um, but you kind of chase maybe like the salary and you maybe see it as like a glam, like a bit yeah. of a glamorous role in reality. Like, I, don't think I mean, there's any glamorous roles in, in, <laughs> uh, in, in law, I'll be honest, it's, 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 it's hard. It's not really very glamorous but yeah and then um in terms of getting my training contract um i was applying for training contracts where i was paralegal in and i wasn't getting anywhere so that was becoming like really disheartening like that was quite hard yeah. when you're working somewhere and you're applying for the training contracts and like you they're saying no try again next year or try in two years time and you're like i want to be qualified in two years time but i want to still be paralegal in and applying for a training contract so I just I went on Google. I went on Google and I searched for for personal injury firms and I just sent emails out and I just emailed and I, it just so happened that um, I emailed the firm who I eventually was offered a training contract at and that was literally just an email to like the generic email address so the managing partner had picked up and I was asking do you have any training contracts. And he was like, yeah, possibly, send us your CV. So I sent my CV across, they had me in for an interview. And then they basically said, well, we'll offer you like a trial period. So it was meant to be three months of me doing a paralegal role. Mm -hmm. And then if I pass that, then they'd offer me a training contract. And I was offered it after four weeks. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so they were just like, you know, you, you, you know you're a good fit for the firm so um yeah so if your training contract's yours if you want it um and then yeah and then uh, that, so i qualified in 2016 and um i was made a partner in uh 2020 so i was four years pqe when i when i became oh, a partner exactly. of that firm and that was off the back of a google search and an email yeah crazy <laughs> yeah um, so going back a bit to when you did your um, law degree and your LPC, where did you complete those, perhaps university and location? So my law degree, yeah, that was at um, Kingston University mm -hmm. down in Surrey. Um, so like, a, well, just outside of London. Mm -hmm. um, great uni, like really good like student scene. Um, had a lot of fun in uni um which is i think what what it's about um i actually feel for students now for anybody at university um i know you probably make the most of it and you have a different type of experience and ultimately it's all about staying safe for the moment but you know like i was out like yeah, there were there were no days that weren't student nights when you yeah, live in, yeah. in town or like a student city every night is student night or, or a different bar will have a student night on like you know on a monday and a tuesday or a wednesday it was only like in my final year that i thought oh my god i really gotta like knuckle <laughs> down and, <laughs> and actually like get a degree at the end of it because I, yeah. I actually had a lot of friends and a lot of like people that i lived with shared accommodation with and they had to retake years like when i was graduating they were like starting the first year over again because right. they just yeah and, and and i was i was graduating and they were going back into year one and i'm like, you're gonna be here for forever like yeah. they're gonna be here for 20 years like 
how much is your student debt going to be like mine's bad enough already and there's there's just must be insane and then yeah and then the LPC I'd, I actually moved to Manchester to do the LPC um I was supposed to do it in in London um but I just thought I fancied a bit I actually came up to Manchester for the first time ever and the second time I came to Manchester was when I actually relocated I actually moved on the second ever visit to Manchester because I fell in love fell in love with the city um I wanted a bit of a change as well like I'd lived in London um for 20 years at this point I wasn't born here I was born I was born in Russia I was born in Moscow but I grew up in London um and I just uh, when it came to the LPC I actually took it as an opportunity to get out of London yeah definitely um the plan was to always come back like it was to always come back to London I wasn't planning on um staying in Manchester it just so happened that it's um it's worked out that way and I'll probably never leave <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So definitely took control there. Um, how do you find that your undergraduate law degree actually compared to the LPC? Did you find the LPC harder or perhaps easier? Or um, so the LPC it was it's different, right? So with your the LPC is intense compared yeah. to your um, your degree. Like your degree is spread out. You don't have as many lectures. There's also not as much pressure. It's not as expensive. You know, your, your LPC is expensive. I think it was just over £11,000 when I was mm -hmm. doing it. So you feel like the pressure and also it's, it's, it's in a year or yeah. even less than a year when you sort of take the exam periods and the breaks. Um, and people are a lot more serious on the LPC as well. When I was doing the corporate route, a lot of people already had training contracts and I was actually one of the few that didn't. I was probably in a handful of maybe five or six people who did not have training contracts. So all the people that did have training contracts, their um, future employers were actually paying for them to, to do the to do oh. the LPC. So they were super serious, like really serious. Like if you tried like, I don't know, being funny in a class, they, they, they were just like, no, like if we don't, <laughs> we don't get certain grades um you know our employees are going to pull our training contracts and then we're going to have to repay like i just remember this this one guy and he was just like panicking because he thought he was going to fail his test and he was like i don't know how i'm going to repay this like they're going to ask for, for me to pay the lpc back and i don't know how i'm going to do it i was like you'll be fine you know and everybody was fine everybody did really well and even like um everybody who didn't have a training contract when they were doing the lpc they got a training contract relatively you know quickly after after finishing the lpc yeah. so um but yeah lpc is 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 intense plus i did the corporate route which probably you know didn't really help because you know it was focused more on the business side um whereas i didn't end up doing that when i when i went into uh, my job role i think if i did the commercial route it would have probably been a little bit more easier so and um but it was it was it was still fun because i was in a new city i was making new yeah. friends um you know I'd like manchester had even when i was doing it had a great nightlife like obviously it's completely changed now to yeah. what it was when i first moved here it's insane but um it was still a lot of fun it was still really really good and i lived in a city center so um and it was probably the first time that i didn't actually have a part-time job to worry about as well because i'd worked I'd worked from the age of 16 all the way um, through through my A-levels, um, through university. And then when it came to the LPC, I had to kind of put all my focus into it um, yeah. because that was it. Like, that was the end of the road in terms of your education. Like, you know, then you had to go out and you had to get a job. And that's when you actually started, you know, thinking, like, I need to get a training contract, you know. Fun yeah. kind of has to stop here, and you've got to like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, just take, just take just take it quite seriously, really. And and um, there were a lot of like events on as well. Like we had like talks, and you could like go. And I, I remember doing like shadowing and work experience at, at a court. Um, it was really good, but you know, a year is not very long, is it? And it and it yeah. went really really quickly. Um, but no, it was it was um, it's hard, um, different um to to your degree your degree i think you're learning like you know you can kind of like pick your topics and do topics that you enjoy whereas like the lpc is getting you ready for the real world yeah definitely um so obviously the we've moved a bit away from the lpc now in terms we have an, a new instruction of the sqe yesterday we talked with daisy who's a essex law student at the university of essex um and she gave us our th her thoughts on the SQE. What do you think about it? Do you think he'll make it easier to get into uh, the legal profession or perhaps more harder? 
So I'll be honest, I don't actually know that much about the SQE. Like I wish I knew a lot more, but the SQE, I think all the details are kind of coming out now and they started coming out towards the end of last year, which is when I launched my firm. Um, so I was like, my fo my focus has really, really been on, on the firm. Um, I've kept up to date with the SQE. So I know like obviously the prices have been released and things like that. And there's been yeah. a few surprises by the fact that actually it's not as accessible as everybody had sort of thought that it was going to yeah. be. Um, still equally as expensive, um, spread over a, a, a longer years. Mm. Um, so you might have more time to sort of save and pay for it, but I think it's it's still quite expensive. I think what you will have though, is you will have people who might not have otherwise qualified, actually yeah. qualifying through that route, which I think is really, really good. Um, yeah. But I don't think it it really takes away the one of the biggest barriers which is cost yeah. um and i and i think that until that is really you know reduced um i think there will still remain that that barrier and and but ultimately you know the sq will replace training contracts um i think the long stop for training contracts is 2033 so nobody will be having training contracts after that date um so it will it will replace them um i think it's it's good that people can work and, and qualify as well. I think that's a positive. Um, but I think I think we're going to really have to wait and see um, what the sort of like the true effects of it are going to be and whether it does in the long run sort of have the benefits and the advantages that they say it's going to have. Um, I know I think people are starting on it now. Um I think the first few ones have, have, have kind of like, you know, started yeah. that now. So it'll be it'll be interesting um, to see it. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, that we're not referring to training contracts in the future, yeah. which is going to be really, really strange. But, um, yeah, I, I, do you know what as well? I think employers, um, as long as they get on board and they can understand it fully, like, for example, if I do employ people in the future, I would have to understand how it works, exactly right. what it means to me as an employer. As long as employers can can you know come back it and get on board, there's no reason why it can't work. Um, I think it's just a case of seeing whether it actually makes you know uh, the the difference that they kind of promised that it will do. Yeah, definitely. And like you say, it doesn't really eliminate the financial cost, which for some people, unless you have the support of like perhaps a law firm behind you even with the lpc it can be a massive struggle yeah your law firm will either fund that um you can i mean th there are options there are um i think education loans if i'm not <laughs> mistaken i think you can get like a loan to cover it um and i know a few people that have got loans and they've only just stopped paying them off yeah. um so it, it's going to take a really long time to actually pay those loans off if you do take them or you know do you save as well like do you save your own money whilst you're working to then fund it or does an employer fund it? like it's it's still really really expensive and i think it's it's a shame i think that there, there, there was something in the news of like a few days ago that somebody is coming out and they're saying well it's you know ours is going to be a bit cheaper um but i didn't i didn't even bother looking at the prices because i think it's still going to be really really expensive yeah. unless someone comes out and says right the whole course is like 1500 pounds it's just it's still going to be unaffordable for a lot of people basically oh massively definitely um so would you say in that sense do you think it's as tough as everyone says as it is to gain a training contract would you say um do i think it's tough to yeah i've been so since i launched my firm i've been doing a lot of work on um on linkedin and i've done um i've put a few posts on where i've done like a cv review initiative um and i said right any any law student looking for a for a job like their first their first role not even training contracts just yeah. trying to get on the ladder just trying to get their foot in the door of a firm as like a paralegal and um, drop me an email with your cv and i'll do a review and i'll get back to you and this was on a sunday night right so um and i had something like 50 emails by monday wow. morning and it was just insane because I actually didn't realize how many students maybe use LinkedIn, which I think is really, really good. Um, and this was all people like, just struggling to just get paralegal jobs, um, let alone sort of training contracts. Um, 
Yeah, it's tough. Um, the pandemic isn't going to help. Um, yeah. I think what's going to happen now is that um, there's going to be almost like a backlog of students that are going to w need to get legal jobs, mm -hmm. but employers aren't recruiting it's really really difficult like i have people messaging me often asking about jobs you know i can't you know they'll, they'll they can do it remotely but it's it's difficult because how as an employer do you recruit someone remotely especially in like a law firm where there's so many sort of rules and regulations and in terms of how people you know, deal with client data, um, all the privacy um, issues. It's really, really difficult for employers. And I think some employers just haven't really got on board with recruiting yeah. um, remotely, mm -hmm. um, which means that there's a lot of um, students, graduates who haven't been able to to start, you know, to start in, the, in their legal careers, really, and start working for somewhere. And I think, you know, as we come out of lockdown, does that just mean that there's more people now competing for the same jobs? Mm -hmm. um, is that going to make it harder? So, yeah, I, I think, um, I think in terms of getting training contracts, it's always been tough. Mm -hmm. um, it's not impossible. Um, I know if you don't have one and you're applying for them, it feels like it's impossible. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's just about getting that experience and, and doing the applications. Um, and if something isn't working, like, for example, it wasn't working for me when I was applying for, like, corporate commercial firms. Yeah. Um, well, you, you change and, you know, you, you adapt and you try other firms. Um, you know, maybe you sort of... You know, when I was when I did get my training contract, I was, I got that offer, and then I had other emails saying, "Oh, we can offer." You know, I had I had like another training contract offer, and I was like, well, yeah. well, "Like, why is this happening? Like, why?" Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like buses. You wait for one, and then a load turn up, yeah. and you're like, "Well, where have you been in for the last like <clears throat> two or three years?" Yeah. Um, it's tough, um, and I think you know training contracts are are difficult um to come by because of just how many people want them are looking for them and just how you know how few there actually are out there and how do you make yourself stand out and um, when i'm reviewing cvs um very few stand out to me um and 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 that's a shame um and what i do in my reviews is i, is I tell people like, this is what you can do to stand out and there's a few really really simple things like having an intro in your cv a little bit about yourself like you know this is me um this is the firm i want to work at um um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to basically get started, you know, just a little intro that's going to catch the recruiters um, or your future employer's eye and make them want to read the rest of your CV. Um, and I think as well what a lot of law students um, don't do is they don't include like work experience outside of law. So they'll, they'll list like a week's work experience they've done in a law firm. I'm like, well, have you had like any other jobs? Because surely this can't be the only job you've had. Yeah. And, and you realise that actually they've worked in retail or they, they've worked in catering or they've done something else and they just haven't put it on a CV. And I'm like, you do need to put things like that on your CV because that's experience. Like you've, you know, yeah. you've, you've done something. Um, but it is like, yeah, it is, it is a, yeah, it's, it's not easy. Um, a lot of, um, a lot of graduates and a lot of students don't like putting like hobbies and interests on. Um, I don't know whether they just feel like their hobbies and interests won't be interesting to yeah. to um, an employer, but actually they are. And a few CVs that I saw and like people were like, "Oh, we play tennis," or "We're in a band," um, and you know they're like amazing skills to have because if you're in a band, that means that you know you you what you you're good at teamwork you're working with other, with other people you you know you've got to train you've got to practice um mm -hmm. you've got to promote your band like you've got to sell tickets and then you've actually got to turn up and perform so yeah, it's amazing and I, and I don't know why people sort of leave things like that off their cv um because i think it makes a difference and, and i find it interesting anyway because ultimately i think if you're an employer and you're recruiting someone you're going to recruit them you know as the the person that they are so you want you know you want someone interesting someone you're going to get along with um obviously someone who's going to do a good job as well in your cases yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely um how did you feel when you eventually obviously you said that it took quite long to um secure your training contract how did it feel yeah. when you finally did and started it yeah it's it's amazing it's an amazing feeling you can't quite 
describe it because you achieved something that you've worked really hard for um what's nice i think as well is when you do sort of and you know i didn't have any help or anything like that i just kind of like worked i paralegaled um on really low salaries as well and at times where you do struggle because you're on you know on a really low salary and you're living out you know you're living on your own it can be really really tough um so when you do finally get it you you feel you feel great but you also feel like everything's been worth it um if that makes sense because there are there can be really tough times really difficult times where you feel like oh what's the point like you know it's should i just go and just you know get a job in something else like why am why do i keep putting myself through this like yeah. we through all these rejections like <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you can spend days at assessments as well and you can spend days on just applications answering some of these questions researching these firms um and then you get nowhere so you do start to feel you can't you can feel quite down about it so when you do finally achieve it you know you do if you feel proud of yourself and you feel like it has been worth it um and you know you carry that feeling through you carry that feeling through too when you qualify um and the, the great thing about when when you qualify is you can go to the law society and you can have your admission ceremony and um mine popped up on my um facebook memories Amazing. um from four years ago in february i was at my admission um ceremony um and it, i just i just remember like how like how proud you do feel like getting up on stage and getting your little certificate and uh, and then coming off and then there's everyone else and so everyone else sort of shares that feeling and their friends and their family are there um so that's a really really nice like event to go to when when you do qualify um but other than that yeah you then you qualify and um well i guess the other good thing is that you do get a pay rise when you qualify because you're no longer a trainee and they have to yeah. pay you a bit better <laughs> yeah so that's um that's that's the positive um but yeah and then and then it's just back to work and that's yeah. it and then, and then you just never stop working <laughs> yeah so in the firms that you're applying to for your training contracts obviously you said you applied to quite a few were there particular qualities that you were looking at um that you wanted that some sounded out more than others um they could pass on to viewers do you mean like the qualities in the firms or yeah. It, the qualities in oh no i wasn't looking at anything i just wanted someone <laughs> to give me a training <laughs> it was do you know what it is i've seen a big difference now to um what's on offer um i feel like employers are actually offering a lot more than just maybe training contracts and when i was applying for them they were just like it's either a trade like it's just a trade it's just a job like you know a, a training contract is another word for a job and it is that's what you're applying for you are applying for a job the only difference is is that they have to um train you <laughs> they have yeah. to offer you some sort of training and then they have to send you on some courses but ultimately you are just just doing a job when i was applying i wasn't looking for anything like in particular in the firms um i just one of the training contract at, at that stage and i would have probably done anything for one or worked anywhere for one <laughs> yeah so I, I guess almost going with that um would you say that it matters where you do your training contract or just the fact that you qualify anywhere it looking back it, it probably does matter um because two years is a long time you want to be you want to be happy in two years um yeah. you also want uh, a firm who are going to invest in 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 your training and in actually sitting down with you and teaching you something okay you don't kind of just want to be left on your own to get on with it so you do want to you know join a firm that at least wants to invest in its trainees and i think that's quite important um also i think looking at what kind of support is out there for trainees like are you going to be the only trainee or yeah. are they going to be other trainees like i think i was the only trainee uh, like trainee solicitor at one point in my firm um like there weren't that many trainees there so yeah. that's quite i think quite important as well but i think it comes down to the type of firm you're at i trained at a relatively sort of small firm where i've been about 15 members of staff so so um there was never going to be like a whole like trainee intake the way there is at certain firms like some firms will take on like 20 to 30 trainees if not more 
um, and then only keep certain trainees at the end. And I think this is quite important as well. I think it's always important when you are um, applying or accepting a training contract to actually ask about, um, you know, what's your retention policy like? Am I going to have a job at the end of these two years? Because that's something you actually don't think about um, until you get closer. And, and then you start thinking, oh, my God, have I actually got a job after these two years yeah. or not? And that's quite important as well. Um, to think you know what's it like and and my firm i think they pretty much um retained everybody who trained there um because at that point they did invest the, you know time and, and effort in those trainees yeah. and i kind of you know felt safe in that sense that i wasn't um going to be looking at a job and apparently as well i read somewhere on um i don't know whether it was I think it might have actually been Facebook um, that there's a firm in London that is basically advertising paralegal roles for newly qualified solicitors. Um, so they want newly qualified solicitors to apply for paralegal roles. And what they're basically saying is for people who haven't been kept on. Um, so they want solicitors in paralegal roles and paying them a paralegal salary, um, basically just taking advantage of, of the fact that they may not have been kept on at their firm, which I think is yeah. just... It's terrible and I'm like I'm a big advocate now and um, when I launched my firm I've had people messaging me going we'll work for you for free you don't have to pay us we'll do this wow. we'll do that and, and I find that really really like sad um, that that is happening um, yeah. if I ever get to the position where I want to recruit someone I will be paying them a salary um, I don't sort of want to take advantage of what's going on in the job market there's also people that have come to me and said um we've applied for these jobs and they've told us we've been successful but we have to pay them um to work for them um wow. and i think one company wanted like 300 pounds a month um to give the the like the employee work experience or paralegal and experience so like how crazy is that that that's what we're having to deal with in the legal industry like that's how that's how desperate like basically some some students probably feel and it's 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 awful that there are companies out there taking advantage of that like you know offering people jobs and then saying well actually you're you're you have to pay us yeah. um work for us <laughs> yeah crazy. <laughs> So yeah, anybody who wants to work for me, there's a, there's a, yeah, you have to pay me three hundred pounds a week, yeah. and then I might yeah. like, give you some work experience. Crazy, yeah. isn't it? Mental. Um, I see we just had a question in. Do you need a two one to get a training contract? Oh, this is a good question. Um, do, uh, so I got a two one. Um, do you need a two? No, I'm I, I'm going to say no. I think if you if you have a law degree, um, you should you that shouldn't put you off just because you don't have a two one or a first. It shouldn't it shouldn't put you off applying. Um, I think what you might have to do is you you, you probably might have to, um not so much explain but basically try and bolster your cv with your other sort of achievements and your other qualities that might make up for the fact that you didn't get a 2-1 yeah. um because ultimately a lot of things can happen at university you're there for years you know you change as a person you might go through something something might happen at university that might impact you um <clears throat> you know something with family something at home that impacts on your ability to get the degree that you ultimately wanted to to get so i think um that's why i should never put you off because personal circumstances are important um so definitely still apply um but you might just have to maybe show a little bit extra that would um set you apart from someone with with a higher degree but it certainly should not put you off yeah definitely um yesterday with daisy who uh is the law student we discussed that um the legal industry can often be quite a who you know not what you know um did you feel like that was the case when you were applying for your training contracts and that no i didn't know anyone <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. So, so no. I mean, I'd moved to Manchester, and you know, I was applying for the jobs within a year, and I, I didn't know anyone. Um, 
So no, I, I, I think it's, I think sort of when you're looking at it from the outside, you, you might have that perception that, you know, you might have friends who have parents who are solicitors or they know someone who's a solicitor and they can kind of get you an interview or they can give you tips on like what this applic what you know what this firm wants to see in your application so you might feel like you know um they're at an advantage and you've got a disadvantage because you might not know those people but no i i, I don't i don't think that that's the case yeah. at all i think i think it can be in limited circumstances but on the whole i think you know you stand just as much of a good of a chance of, of, of getting a training contract, whether you know someone or, or you don't in, in a firm. Um, you know, I didn't know anyone. I hadn't even heard of my firm until, you know, I found them through a Google search. So it's not, you know, it's not, I, I think what does happen though in law is once you've been in law for a few years, particularly in one part of law, like personal injury, you do get to know people. Um, and I think that's when you maybe see that, yeah, like I know this person or I know that person. And when you're changing jobs, it might play a role um, where maybe you've worked with someone previously. So you might have a better chance of securing a role at another firm that that person is then at. But in terms of um, trainees, graduates, students applying for jobs, I don't necessarily think that that makes that much of a difference. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously within your training contract, you do your rotations and that. What seats did you sit in? Uh, would you be able to tell us? Yeah, personal injury, personal injury, and personal injury. <laughs> there was no rotation. So um, I was at a personal injury firm. Um, so that's all I did. The, the, what was different in terms of my training was that you can do your litigated and your non-litigated work. So you work on on both things that are in court and outside of court um, and then you do different areas of of personal injury as well like you can do like accident like your road traffic accidents you can do employer liability claims where somebody has an accident at work you can do yep. public liability claims where you're out and about in a supermarket and you slip on a banana or whatever you might be slipping on some water that's yeah <laughs> Just link somewhere and then you can do like um you can do like recovery work as well which is like just like kind of money claims um and things like that and then you can do like cosmetic injury um medical negligence um dental negligence like anything to do with like your body being hurt basically um or you having an accident and being able to blame someone yeah. you you know you, you i could have worked on those cases yeah definitely i just had another question come through i hear that personal injury is coming to an end is that true um i hope not <laughs> having just launched a personal injury firm i hope not but yeah so it's, it, there's some really really like radical changes coming in um the changes are, are mainly around road traffic accidents um so basically um not to bore anyone with the details but what the government are, are, are doing is they're implementing some reforms that mean that if your injury is worth le less than five thousand pounds like a whiplash injury so neck back shoulders like your most common type of injury where a car hits you and your body jolts and because you know you're not expecting it you you can't anticipate it you can't you know prevent your, your body from, from from moving and from being jolted you then suffer whiplash i've been in an accident i've had whiplash it's horrible um but basically what they're trying what the government are saying is these are minor accidents um so if you have an accident like that and your injury is worth less than five thousand pounds then you're not going to be able to recover your solicitor's legal costs so i basically will not get paid that's what they're trying to do so they're trying to drive out part of personal injury law yeah. um which is you know it is is going to impact a lot of people because they are probably the most common type of injuries and that's why the reforms are happening in in the, in the way that they are um you know it's it's backed by insurance companies who don't want to pay for injuries um so you know why do insurance companies want to pay out they don't so um that's why the you know the reform the reforms are coming in um but having said that um road traffic accidents whiplash claims are not the only type of claims out there um you know it also the reforms will also exclude vulnerable road users so if you're a pedestrian or a cyclist or a child so anybody under 18 they're not going to be caught by these reforms um so there's actually still a lot of work for personal injury 
solicitors to do in this area of law. Um, there's also the other types of accidents that are outside of vehicles and cars um, that aren't really affected by the reforms or they are, but on, on a much lesser scale. Um, so, but the one thing I will say about personal injury law, and I actually had a question about this yesterday, was how can you start firm in personal injury? Because how can you predict how many clients you're going to get? Like you surely knew you're not going to have repeat clients. Okay, so that to answer that, firstly, you'd be surprised how many people are repeat clients when it comes to accidents. Okay, like you, you one client can have two, three accidents in wow. in a year, especially if you have a client who is a taxi driver or somebody who is out on the road a lot, whether yeah. it's for work or they they just have to travel. Um, you know they, they you know they they're at risk of having accidents so you, repeat clients are definitely a thing but also um you know there's there's an accident every 20 seconds on the road right so um not in lockdown probably but uh, <laughs> prior to lockdown you know there was an accident uh, every 20 seconds so there's always business out there there's always work to be done um and i think as solicitors i think repeat clients can uh, can be quite rare i think as solicitors we work on a matter and we finish it and we move on to the next one like if you have a client let's say family law who's getting a divorce well how many times is that person going to get divorced no you help that person in that one matter and then you move on and yeah. that person might remarry then get divorced and do that a couple of times in their life which you yeah. know it's fine but you don't start a business thinking, I need repeat clients. And, yeah. um, you know, you, you help the person that needs your help and then you move on to the next one. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess the big question really is why, what is it personally about um, personal injury really that drew you to it? Um, I fell into it. Nothing drew me to it. Um, absolutely nothing drew me to it. I, when I first went for my first paralegal role, I didn't even know what RTA stood for. It's road traffic accident for anybody that doesn't know. <laughs> like me, I didn't know what the offside or a near side of a car was. Okay, I did not drive. Um, I got given this job and I had to call people and tell them that I thought they were at fault for this accident. And I remember this one guy just saying to me, do you even drive? And I, just remember, I was just like, oh yeah, that's not the point. And I, and I just remember getting off the call thinking that is entirely the point because I don't drive. Like, how am I telling somebody else how they should or shouldn't be driving? And at that point, you know, you're looking at the highway code and, you you know, you're listening to what other people are saying. And then and then you, you pick it up um, and then you, you slowly start getting better. And at this point, I wanted a training contract. So I was trying to impress. I was trying to do the best job that I could. So you start you start actually getting good. And when you start getting good at something, you start enjoying it because you're like, oh, I can do this. Um, and then and then I think as well, you kind of start seeing a bit of value that you add to people's um, people's lives when you do have a success, um, especially if you have somebody who is badly injured, um, you yeah. know, and you can win a case um, that could be disputed um, and this person's injured and it's absolutely no fault, you know, of, of theirs um, and they've lost, you know, they, they may be losing money because they're not able to work. They may be struggling to pay, you know, their bills or, or you know, whatever happens. They may even lose their job. Um, you know, people lose their jobs because they're injured and they're not able to return to their full time role. So it's it's actually really, really rewarding when you kind of look behind um, behind the case and you actually see that you've got a client there you're often dealing with cases for long periods of time as well. Like, you know, you can start a case and not finish it for years. So you can yeah. get to know your clients and um, they might, might go to court. So you might have to go to a court hearing with your clients as well. And, you know, depending on how that goes, yeah. <laughs> hopefully if it's, a, if it's a positive outcome, then yeah, great. You know, you don't, but you don't win every case. Um, <clears throat> you do lose some cases. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> How many of those cases would you say actually end up going to court, would you say? Mm, very few. I actually did a post on this today about, like, will my case go to court? So every client I get now, <coughs> I, like, make it quite clear that, look, you know, there's a possibility that we might have to take this to court. We'll get the claim submitted to the insurance company um, or whoever the defendant may be, and then we'll wait a response. But they may dispute it. Now, there's nothing to say that just because you've been injured or you've been in an accident that's that's you're going to get compensation you have to prove a lot of elements and you, and you have to prove that somebody's done something wrong and that's what's caused you your injury so you will get disputes on cases um and you may if you feel like your client has a strong case you may recommend that they take it to court um 
And I mean, in terms of actually issuing and, and then going to court, you know, it's, it's, it's a small number of cases, um, but no case is safe, if that makes sense, because you might say, right, well, only 5% actually end up at trial, but it might be that client's uh, case yeah. included in that. So you can never, I, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit sort of, um, wrong to sort of say to clients that you know only a small percentage of cases end up going to court because that kind of makes them think well I'm never going to be in that percent that's going to end up at court and it just almost always ends up being that client yeah, definitely. <laughs> who does end up at court and um, but you know you we talk about court as if it's you know a really bad thing or a really negative thing and you know often often it's not often it's just the case that you've not been able to agree on something with the other side. It doesn't have to be who's to blame for an accident. It could be just down to value of a claim. You might be saying to your client, I think your claim's worth £10,000, and the other side are saying no chance, it's worth £3,000. Yeah. You know, how would a solicitor, can you say to your client, oh, I think you should take the £3,000? Like, you, you can't. So your recommendation would be, let's take it to court and let a judge decide. Um what your claim is worth so um and you know you might go to court just on on that on that argument yeah definitely i can imagine a bit more of a fun question now so when you're up against the other side <laughs> in a matter and have to litigate who do you hope the defendant insurance will nominate to accept service mm -hmm. of your client's proceedings uh am i saying this right how do i say the care goes Keos. okay right Keos, plexus law Horwich. Farley or DWF? Yeah, Keos, Plexus Law, Horwich Farley or DWF. Um, right, what was the question? Who do I hope to be on the other side? Or who, who, do, who, do, I... yeah, who do you to hope the defendant insurer will nominate to accept service of your client's proceedings? Mm, this is a really good question, by the way. Whoever's obviously done this question really <laughs> knows the... Uh, the insurers uh the choice of solicitors for defending these types of cases by the way they're all a nightmare all four of them sorry if anybody listening wants to hear them but you know they, they are our opponents um but i would probably choose uh keos um just because i think the others can be really sort of difficult opponents um shall we say without giving too much away um they're all tough you know it's not you know the, the defendant solicitors do not give us an easy ride um some can can be a little bit easier to sort of maybe communicate or get along with um so yeah let's go let's go with keos yeah <laughs> i see another question just come in do you use any case management software yeah, I do. So, so for my cases, being a new firm, I'm using um, a software called Clio. Um, so they are a cloud-based um, case management system. So you just log on uh, for a website and it has all your data there and it's brilliant. It's really, really good. And it's, you know, it's not expensive. It costs me like 50 pounds a month. Um, and so far, so good. Yeah, like you, your main thing as a as a firm of solicitors, regardless of what your size is, is to make sure your client data is safe um, and that uh, it's easy to find, easy to store all your documents, mm -hmm. easy to store all your communication. So yeah, Clio. And um, there's loads on the market, um, but I found that they are they do the job. Wow, amazing. Um, so, what pers area of personal injury like do you prefer the most? Would you say? Car accidents, love them. Wow, <laughs> any particular reason? No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's funny because um, when I drive and I see someone driving really badly, I still get like road rage and I'm always like, oh, for God, why are they doing that? Like, you know, you, you get so many crazy drivers on the roads, especially like now. Um, and I get really, really angry and I'm always like, I don't know, why, why are you angry? Like, you know, bad drivers you know keep you in a job like that's that's your yeah. like that's your whole job like you can't get angry with people who yeah. who drive badly because if we all drove perfectly there'd be absolutely no work for me to do um yeah and then the other the other area of personal injury law that i think is really really interesting is your cosmetic um 
injury um so like cosmetic procedures that go wrong and um, that's a really really interesting area of law as well slightly different obviously to to, to road traffic accidents a bit more complex um with sort of what goes on and how you can resolve them um like lip fillers gone wrong um botox gone wrong or like just cosmetic procedures as well um they go wrong so that that's a really really interesting um area of personal injury law that a lot of people probably don't sort of think of um but actually you know it's it's a, it's negligence um when something goes wrong in in those procedures but well, it can be anyway yeah i just had another one come in do you think more law firms will cross the dark side and become defending solicitors post whiplash reform no because you need claims to defend um so i think um what i find quite interesting is that the what happened prior to the reforms it was like us against them and then these reforms came out and they actually realized that without us there's there's no claims to defend and i've done both i i actually started in defendant work um defending the cases that i'm technically now bringing um so i've i've sat on sort of both sides of the fence um but i think what sort of happened is the defendant solicitors um, and even maybe not so much insurance companies because they will still deal with litigants in person. They will still deal with a lot of people trying to bring claims themselves. But the defendant solicitors um, would definitely probably um, equally as worried as claim as claimant solicitors because they need us to issue the cases for them to defend. Mm -hmm. And that's their job. Um, what is happening, though, with, with personal injury? And I know there's obviously like a bit of an interest around this topic is that... Um, Firms are moving away from RTA work. They're moving into other areas of law. So there's always going to be um, cases to bring. There's always going to be work to do. Yeah. It's just their focus might be in different areas, but there's always going to be cases um, cases to defend. Um, but no, you won't have that 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 sort of great movement from claimant to defendant thinking that well there's no work for claimant so there must be more work for defendant i don't think that it will yeah. necessarily work like that i think we still as claimant solicitors need to issue cases or to at least present cases for there to be somebody to defend it yeah definitely um so when obviously you're um working on a case and that what is it like when you have to go to trial would you say to go to court um i love going to court you know i actually thought about cross qualifying to um to become a barrister um because i love my days in court like um i i feel like um i love being a solicitor but i do sort of like that thrill almost when you go to court um you're super super nervous like you know you're waiting there for your client and you're like oh please turn up please turn up because you know someone the risky client isn't going to turn up they might bottle it on you know on the morning or the hearing um you know and and you're just there waiting and they turn up and they're just as nervous as you and yeah. then you've got to try and make like a small talk and tell them everything's going to be okay and you don't yeah. know if it's going to be okay it probably isn't going to be okay no it is it's generally okay i try and go to all my cases that i can as long as you know that i can get to them yeah. um they're not on the other side you know of the country then i will go to them and um, i actually had a really really lovely client um who was like a bit sad she was like oh I'm like I settled her case and it was going to court and we had a trial date and she was like oh I'm you know I'm, I'm happy that it's settled but I'm sad because I won't get to meet you because we were like it would have been the first time that we'd have actually met even though I'd had a case for for years probably at this point um which was really nice but yeah you turn up to court but look a solicitor is is almost in the background at a trial you yeah. have a barrister and they do all your presenting and they do all your cross-examining and all your opening and your closing statements. And um, you're just really there to for the clients. Well, I am anyway. I will go to try and support the client so they've got someone who they know because they've never met the barrister before. They've probably never spoken to the barrister before. So um, they, they're going to be nervous. If I can go, then, then you know, and be there for the client, um, almost to hold their hand a little bit, then I will be. And also nobody's going to know the file better than than, than, than okay. me um having worked on it for a really long time up, up to that point um but things can go wrong like they can and i was just i was thinking back to like a case when i was at court and i drafted like the statement so as a solicitor you draft your witness statement and then the client you know reads it and signs it and then it goes to court and then that's the main 
document that everybody's sort of going to be questioning them on. And I just remember that, like, you know, the, it came out that something was wrong in this statement. And the judge was like, well, so have you read your statement? Like, did you, like, why have you signed it if it's wrong? And she just looked at me and said, well, my solicitor <laughs> drafted it. And uh, she said it was, you know, and I just signed it. And I'm just sat there thinking, oh, my God, get me out of here. Like, what is going on? Like, <laughs> But that's... Um, you know, I think that happens in, in in a lot of cases, and you know, clients obviously trust us to do the job, but ultimately they do still need to um, be happy with their witness evidence because it will get you know picked apart line by line in a court hearing. So you can have little moments like that, um, but you know, ultimately I think it's all about the end result. Um, and even that, sometimes you know, you might not have the result that you wanted, but you also know that you've given your clients their day in court and for a lot of clients that's actually really really important um nobody wants to lose um but if you take it to court and you give it your best shot and the judge still prefers the other side you know evidence it, it kind of is what it is in, in in that regard but that's why you you, know, you have that day in court and you have your opportunity um obviously as a solicitor you don't you don't want to lose like i remember coming home from like a case that i'd, I'd lost and it was um took us ages to get there, ages to get back, really long day. Not the result that we wanted. It was an awful result. Yeah. <laughs> and um I just remember just being so upset and I didn't get over it for about a week. Um it it was like because I'd had this case for years and I'd done so much work on it. You'd like you almost mourn like the loss of this case. It's yeah, it's intense, but um really, really like interesting days in court. Just had another one in, just as you were finishing there. The timing of the whiplash reforms is terrible and will impact the lives of many businesses and individuals. Do you think that it will be sustainable in the long run or will we return to the current process? Oh, I'm loving these um, RTA reform questions. They're yeah. very, 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 very specific. Um, they're going to be awful. The reforms are, are, are bad. They are designed to be bad. Okay, they're not designed to just have a little bit of an impact. Yeah. Um, they're designed to wipe out whiplash claims, which are the, the majority of um, personal injury claims. The, uh, the government's aim behind the reforms is to get rid of whiplash claims. And when you understand that that is what their aim is, you can understand why it's <clears throat> why the reforms are as bad as they are, because they don't want people to make whiplash claims. It isn't about compensating litigants in person or giving people their own opportunity to bring their own cases. It's about getting rid of those cases. They don't want them to be brought, whether it's by solicitors or by litigants in person, they don't want them full stop. So they're not going to make it easy, you know, because, and um, just in contrast, you know, you can do your own divorce online. You know, you can log on and you can file for a divorce. Does that mean that it's simple? Does that mean that it's easy? No, there's so many things. There's so many other factors that are at play. What happens if like your other half doesn't respond or they respond with something else? You know, what what happens then? And that's when legal expertise comes into play. That's why you need it. It's going to be awful because I think claim the claims industry is worth around 3.6 billion um a year so when you wipe out a really big part of that it doesn't just impact solicitors it impacts medical experts it impacts people who office like law firm offices um hundreds and thousands of staff will probably lose their jobs in some capacity maybe not directly in law firms people who support law firms um people who do things like paper you know print out paper or print letterheads um who provide all those additional services their jobs are at risk at risk as well um, and ultimately uh, people who are injured um are going to be left with um with with nobody compensating them or a lot less compensation than what they need now um how are they going to find solicitors like i'm staying in the industry anybody who's listening who has an accident um i will be there to help my clients um and i will make it work i'm a small business i launched my business um knowing that the reforms are going to come in um I knew they would happen. I'm not in denial about it. I know it's going to be tough. I still think there's there's people that will need our help. They will need my help. Um, you know, not everybody can use the internet. Not everybody can, you know, run their own cases, especially when they're disputed to obtain evidence, to obtain medical evidence, and then to value their own injuries. It's impossible. When you break it down, you realize how much of like 
a big task is on people's hands and there will still be solicitors there. I will still be there. I'll still be doing the claims and I'll be working for my clients. Yeah, definitely. Amazing work that obviously you're doing. So you're saying that, that um, you obviously opened your own business, knowing that these reforms will come in. Um, when did you decide that it was the right time to open your own law firm and what was almost your decision process behind it? Yeah, it was, it was locked down. Like I just knew that I kind of didn't want to go back to like my job yeah. <laughs> almost like not that there was anything particularly wrong with my job or what I was doing and I was doing quite similar to what I'm doing now I just thought it was time for a change and I thought that there was never going to be another opportunity like that yeah. um a few things kind of just fell into place where I thought right well couldn't go on holiday couldn't really spend money on anything so I started to save I thought and do you know what else it was it was it made me realize that you could do cases you could run cases from anywhere you don't i always had this idea that you needed a fancy like city center law firm office um or that you needed loads of staff but actually you didn't um, and clients still needed your help uh, regardless of whether you were at home in in the office and lockdown also meant that uh, courts um you know they, they embraced technology um yeah. and it propelled the legal industry um probably by about 20 years in terms yeah. of you know uh, advancements in, in in how they were doing things and actually you can offer that service you can deliver a good service from from anywhere so yeah. why sort of um, you know, put restrictions on yourself as to how, you know, how big your firm is? Your firm doesn't have to be big. My firm is me. Um, I outsource a, a, a few things which make my life a lot easier. I have experts that help me um, in different parts of running a business, which is great. Um, but, yeah, it just made me realize that I wanted to um, a, a bit of a change, a bit of a challenge. Um, and I'm certainly getting that now. Yeah, definitely. Um so what would you say is the most difficult aspect of being a law firm owner, would you say? Oh, God, it, it, it's all <laughs> difficult. It's all really, really tough. And um, knowing what to focus your efforts on is is really, really hard. Like, you know, you, you know you need to bring in new clients. You know you need to attract more work, but you also need to do the cases and, and progress the cases you do have. Um, you've also got to have, you know, like starting a business is one thing. Starting a law firm is is another. It's like an added layer of compliance, yeah. regulation. Um, so it's really, really hard sort of juggling all those things. Um, so it's I, I think it's, it's, it's sort of maybe knowing how, what to prioritize in your day to day. Um, with me being a new firm as well, there's like there's so much to kind of like learn to, to get used to. Um, yeah, it's it's all equally tough. The easy bit is actually the law, and I say this now: yeah. like the law is actually it actually becomes the, the the safe part of your job because someone asked me a legal question. I love it. I'm like, yes, it's an easy question. I can answer this. <laughs> if someone asks me something about Google or SEO or Google Ads or uh, I don't even know something about my website, about the traffic yeah. that's coming to my website. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't know. Like accounting yeah. as well, getting used to things like that. It's um. You know, it's because it's it's the it's you, you you think sort of when you when you stop being a trainee or when you leave uni or DLPC that you stop learning, and um, when you start your own business, you actually realise just how much learning you've still got to do. Oh yeah, definitely. I see a question just come in. How did you become a partner at your previous firm so young? Ah, oh, well, you just. Um, it's hard work you just work as hard as you can you try and uh you try and impress i guess the right people um you you put the work in i think and that shows you know you don't you you, you put yourself forward for a lot of things um and I think you just work hard. There's there's no sort of magic formula. It's not it's not anything like that. You just have to put the work in. Um not shy away from things as well like take the opportunities as they come put yourself forward for opportunities mm -hmm. like offer to do things that maybe someone else isn't doing um just try and set yourself apart um <clears throat> and also maybe show co show commitment and and you know to to the firm and when when you train um when you qualify when you're there for for, for a long time i think that shows commitment as well i mean i did 
didn't stay partner for very long I left relatively yeah. soon after that and that was because um you know my goal was was to reach partner level and then when I reached it I just thought right what next um yeah. I didn't think I didn't think that I would really feel like that but I did and um that's kind of what put me on on this journey and then now I know what's next and it's tough and it's hard um managing a firm is unlike anything that I've ever done before um it's by far the hardest thing people say setting up a firm is the easy part and they are right at the time yeah. when I was setting up and people were saying oh setting up is the easy part I was like you're kidding me this is hard yeah. <laughs> right they they, they they were right that was the easy part and this is the hard part um but I've got some really really good people who are helping me along the way um who are just amazing and you don't feel alone that was one of the things i was worried about like setting up on your own are you going to feel lonely are you going to feel alone are you going to feel isolated how are you going to keep on on, on top of things that are changing on uh, you know especially with the reforms or you know like case law but actually you do you've got great communities out there you've got great platforms like linkedin and then you actually slowly build a little team around you and you don't, you don't have to employ them you can just outsource your work to them but they are like they keep you rooted and they keep you sort of like sane and um you know you speak to them on a daily basis like and and it's and it's great and 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 that's having that support around you as well like in friends and family and that's really really important as well that has, i definitely underestimated the amount of support i would probably need um from those close to me um because uh, starting a business any business is going to take over your life um whether you you know whether you, you think it will or, or won't it definitely will and it definitely does um having a really good support structure around you inside and outside of your business is really important mm -hmm. um, and having nice clients like i will i will actually mention that because one of the reasons why i set up my firm is because i got absolutely sick and tired of abusive clients um i've had some really horrible clients like who actually make you dread like logging on and going to work yeah. And you can't do anything about it. Um, you know, you can raise it with your manager or with your boss. Um, but ultimately, you know, if they say to you, you know, you, you're still going to do this case. You can't you can't not do it. Um, and you have to work on, on those cases. You don't have any say in what type of clients you, you work on, what types of cases you work on. You might have cases that you're running that you will, you don't think are going to be any good, aren't going to win. <clears throat> but you still have to do them because that's your job. And that was another part. You know, I had some really, really tough clients that made me think that actually I want to have control over the type of work that I do and the type of clients I have. Um, and that's that's been a positive. Don't get me wrong, I will have difficult clients. We all do. Um, but it's the abusive clients that I always found really, really sort of tough to deal with, especially when you don't get much support from your employers or as much as you should. Um you know and, that, and that's you know for me that's always going to be a priority if i do recruit staff i'm you know there's there's none of that going on at, yeah. at the injury solicitor <laughs> yeah um another question just has come through is this the beginning of the end for accident management companies <clears throat> um oh my god these questions <laughs> i feel like yeah. we've gone totally off like the path <laughs> that we had like with all these questions about like law firms and talking all about accident management i am um, no no accident if we know one thing about accident management companies is that they will survive anything almost anything um no they are looking to um to rebrand um to change their offering accident management companies are only worried um personal injury so what happens is an accident management company is somebody who is either uh, has a shop front or a garage and what happens if you drive and you're in an accident you might need like a replacement car so you need to get to work the next day you know you can't wait on your insurance company an insurance company will take three to four weeks to probably pay you out for, for your for your car loss so you go to like a company and then they give you a vehicle they say for free it's not for free it's really expensive <laughs> and then um and then they um they deal with your vehicle repairs and then they basically recommend a firm of solicitors to handle your personal injury case so a lot of PI solicitors will work with claims management companies in terms of the where they get the work in. Um, no, claims management companies, PI is only a small part of their business. They're, they are going to focus on the hire. They're going to focus on the vehicle side of things. They're going to focus on um, other elements of their business um, because personal injury is only 
a part of their business so yeah they might lose they they, they, they will lose um but also um it's worth remembering that claims management companies can actually run pi cases there's nothing that's going to stop a claims management company running a pi case which is another awful part of the reforms because people are then um you know are going to be outside of solicitors doing their cases to um to claims management companies who aren't legally qualified running their cases potentially yeah crazy um always going back to the le the injury solicitor obviously or in law firm have you found that in lockdown obviously maybe not as many incidents have been occurring in that have you found it a bit more difficult to um gain customer and gain up that drive for them yeah so um i think accidents are down by like 60 percent so um we're at 40 percent in terms of claims and i've started a business in a in a highly competitive area because there's a lot of personal injury firms um not just where i'm based around manchester but all over the uk and we're all competing for the same almost for the same accidents for the same type of work of course it's, it's that presents its challenges um it's it's possibly um it's i guess you have to be innovative and you have to maybe look outside the box you might not have accidents that are happening in lockdown you might have claims actually that people have put off making yeah. because um they were too busy at the time and then suddenly you know they're in lockdown they might be on furlough they might not they might have a bit more time on their hands they might have even lost their job and they want to claim against an employer where they had an accident it's about looking um outside of those restrictions and actually looking and 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 and, and considering those cases that come through the door that maybe you wouldn't normally accept if you had maybe a pick of cases you know you might you know i'm accepting really tough cases at the moment because um I'm giving them a go and they and you know i don't shy away from those types of cases and and also if the client says to me right well we didn't have time to make these cases then you know this accident was like two years ago and they have three years to bring a claim you, you might you might take that on um because it's it's not easy to yeah it, there's there's less accidents happening so ultimately there's going to be less work as lockdown lifts and the restrictions lift um it is anticipated to go back to the same level of accidents and um, it's worth mentioning as well that even though there have been less accidents the accidents that have been taking place have actually been more serious mm -hmm. um because people are speeding um there's um you know less cars on the roads so people tend to travel a bit faster there's also more cyclists there's more people running on the roads there's generally more pedestrians and um, a lot of people are running who um or exercising outside who might not really you know might not appreciate the dangers of, of being out on the road especially cyclists you know so many people are now out on bikes who um and with less traffic you're probably less aware you're less sort of worried about cars and things like that but actually it's a time where you have got to you know be concerned and make sure that you're safe out there so it's a, it's a different type of accident whilst there's less car crashes the ones that are happening probably a bit more serious um and then there's the different types of accidents that are taking place um but yeah it's, it's a huge impact and it means looking outside the box in terms of the kind of cases that, that you are taking on as a business because you you need to survive um and get through it yeah massively um i think just to end off unless anyone has any other questions uh do you have any advice or tips to law students which isn't um perhaps common knowledge to them any insider info um, that can perhaps help them applying for jobs this summer, really? Yeah, I think um, I think the sh students applying this summer are going to have a hard time, really. They're going to have a hard job on their hands because I think, I mean, there is obviously going to be a bit of leeway in terms of we've had lockdown. They might not have the experience. They might not have done the things that they wanted to do to maybe put them, set themselves apart. Um, I think if you as a student have got involved in things, like if you volunteered um, for something, put that on your CV and um, make yourself stand out. I mentioned earlier as well about the intro line, you know, yeah. utilize that, put that on your CV because that honestly, to me, it's like, I can, I will probably be offering people interviews just on their intro line alone because that yeah. to me, it's like, that catches my eye. It makes me like, you know, am I going to be interested to read on or I'm not? And I think that's really, really vital. And it needs to be like three or four 
you know, sentences long, a um, couple of lines, and, you know, it's not, you know, you're not having to, you know, write out a biography or anything like that, but just set yourself apart, set the scene for, for the rest of your CV. Um, get involved in projects, volunteer. There's still so many opportunities to, 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 to get involved with things. Um, I think skill sets are really sort of undervalued or by students anyway in terms of how they present them. Um, I think students sort of think, well, I don't need to sort of say this because it goes without saying. But actually, if you've done something, like you have volunteered or you've, um, I don't know, like for example, this, this, this one guy was um, delivering meals um, during lockdown um, for, I think it was Age UK, if I'm not mistaken. And I just thought that that was amazing. You know, like he didn't have to do that. Nobody has to volunteer. Um, you're not getting paid. You're doing it because you want to do something nice um, and you want to help others. So things like that, you know, you you definitely put that on your CV because yeah. it makes you stand out. Um, and also, just on a final note, use things like LinkedIn. Um, I know loads of students do. Um, loads of graduates do as well. Um, it's a great platform for finding jobs, um, you know, probably better than a lot of the websites out there. I hadn't actually realized how good it was for jobs. I'd never used LinkedIn until I actually started my business. Um, but it is really, really good for when you're looking for, for work. And also you can connect with people um, who might work at the firm that you want to apply for. Um, and you can connect, you know, with people who work in HR. Don't do it in like a creepy way. Um, and don't like bombard them with loads of questions, but just do it in a way that makes them aware of you. Um, but post as well, actually post things because it's one thing connecting with someone and not having like a picture, never posting anything, you know, just having a profile that's really bland and, you know, it doesn't, you can't actually be identified from it. Post things on there. Um, even as a student, just, you know, you might not feel like, LinkedIn is a platform for you, but it is. There's loads and loads of students out there giving other students tips, advice, um, or even if you're just getting the tips and advice from somebody. But make your profile like about you so people can actually identify you and see a bit of your personality through it. It's not it's not Facebook, it's got to stay professional. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't have a picture of all your mates in like the yeah. pub or something like that <laughs> on LinkedIn. So, so you've got to keep it professional, but it's a really, really good sort of um little icebreaker for certain companies that you are going to be applying for and it can be really really good for that yeah uh how can i get litigation experience are there any training courses litigation experience i don't know if there are any courses um i think the best way to get litigation experience is to get into a firm that does litigation um if you're interested in going to court but also i think um you might even be able to apply for like work experience at court. Um, yep. I did my first ever work experience at Crown Court, um, and, and 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 that really sort of set me on on, and that was in school, um, and that set me sort of you know on the path to law, being really interested in it. Um, yeah, see if there's any. Um, there's actually um, a charity. Um, I can't remember what it's called now, um, <clears throat> but that offers um, basically help. For people um facing court on their own wow. um so i might you know what i might just do a quick search mm -hmm. and i'll see if i can find it because i remember finding coming across this charity and um, because somebody had recommended it to me um i feel like it's it might be called that like, not on your own but it's basically for people who are hmm, no, I'm not going to be able to find it now. Oh, okay. um, <clears throat> I will message you if I find it, and then you can pop it on um, on a post. And and it's basically a charity that helps um, helps people who are facing court on their own. So you could be somebody that will take a call from someone who's got like a court hearing, um, and they just need to talk to someone about it. And it's not about sort of giving legal advice, um, although I think that I think they do offer that as well um but i think it's just to help people like who are facing having to go to court without a solicitor so it's a charity that helps them so that could be another way uh, the other way is to contact local courts and also actually it's worth mentioning that um 
certain court hearings now are streamed live um so you can actually um attend court hearings from the comfort of your own home i think you've got to request access to a hearing but um like i know employment tribunals are doing it because they're open they're open hearings they're open courts so you could go in there as a person and, and watch a hearing um but i think in terms of litigation like actually working on cases um i think you would probably need to get into a firm whether it's as work experience or as a paralegal role or as a legal assistant as well it's worth mentioning that legal assistant roles are a really really good way into a firm and you can progress quite quickly in certain firms um if you show promise and, and initiative so that that could be a, a way in as well yeah i think that's all unless there's any other questions i'll give it a few seconds yeah, i feel like i wish i could find that 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 name of that charity i will message you because i'm sure it'll come to me the second i yeah of course it's <laughs> <laughs> always the way don't think there's any more questions to come in just wait a couple seconds no i'll take it as that um well thank you for having you on me you're welcome thank you for having me and um yeah it's been fun thank you everyone it's very insightful you provided a lot of information for both myself and i'm sure the viewers um so that was our third of four interviews this week here on clip careers tomorrow we'll be interviewing chelsea a trainee barrister if you'd just like to tune in uh thank you for uh, from both me, Eleanor, and all the team here at Clip Careers for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. <laughs>